Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see so many of you here, um, not least from the two universities and uh, a number of the teachers that we worked with, um, as well as academics from America and those involved in different parts of policy development and policy imp implementation. So um, I'm Roger Austin. Um, I think for about the last 40 years I've been involved in different initiatives, all designed to try and maximize the way that information and communication technologies can enhance learning. So what we're going to talk about today is just the most recent uh, example of that. Um, my colleague, Rhiannon Turner, is a professor of psychology and uh, I'm particularly grateful that she's here because she acted as the independent analyst for the data that we, we gathered. So as Eileen would have mentioned to you, um, the fundamental basis for what we're talking about is this act, the, the Shared Education Act. And some people might set, take the view that this is perhaps the single greatest achievement of the last executive. The fact that this is now enshrined in, in legislation provides us all with a very solid foundation to build on. Eileen mentioned that this is striking this act in um, two ways. One is that it does seek to raise educational outcomes as well as improving community relations. And in that respect, it is quite different to the previous initiatives around EMU and citizenship. I think the other takeaway point, as uh, our American friends like to refer to, um, is the scale of this. As you can see on the slide, uh, almost half of the schools in Northern Ireland are currently involved in shared education. You know that we have 200 post-primary schools, we have 800 primary schools. So not only are half of them already involved, uh, but the Department of Education is exploring ways to, to mainstream this. Most of the teachers that we've worked with and the research that we're going to talk to you about are those involved in the first wave of schools, those in the shared education signature project. And in case you don't know this, uh, those schools are the ones that were generally geographically quite close to each other. The second wave of schools that have just started work go under the heading of CASE, that's collaboration and shared education. And those schools uh, tend to be a little bit further apart and interestingly, uh, the proviso for the way they work is that they are allowed to use 20% of their time uh, for in online interaction. So our challenge, our question really is, um, how can we help those schools that are already involved to sustain the work they've begun? And how can we reach out to the remaining schools? So we're going to use this term blended contact. Um, in case you're not familiar with that, it, it is nothing more complicated really than saying it's a combination of the face-to-face -face work, which was the foundation for a lot of the early work in shared education, with online interaction. We were especially interested to look at this question of what happens between those face-to-face -face encounters. How can we sustain the relationships which are emerging. That um, slide also reminds you of an important thing, which is that this work reaches right down to children in P1, um, all the way through to the end of Key Stage 4. And as we go through the presentation, you'll see that teachers have been very, very uh, adroit in thinking about the affordances of different technologies. So the slide shows you, for example, uh, what video conferencing looks like. It's a product called Collaborate. And for the younger children, that's been an, ex an especially powerful way for real-time interaction. Um, we're also going to be mentioning a, a virtual learning environment called Frontier. Um, you'll take the point that the younger children may not make a great deal of use of that, uh, but the older ones certainly do. So what does this actually look like in practice um, when you've got schools working together? 
Uh, I'm very glad to say that we have a, one of the teachers with us today who um, was involved in this particular project. So the story behind this, this bit of work, two teachers arrived at our course uh, from partner schools, but they didn't know each other. One was teaching English and the other was teaching technology and design. And they had to think about what kind of project could really interest and motivate our children. And as you can see, the solution they came up with was that the students in the English class were going to be uh, the customers, those in the technology and design class were going to be designing a product to a particular brief. So <coughs> the children had a strong focus around a real project to work on. And that's one of the things that seems to us to have been especially important. Um, at the end of their period of time working together, they had a face-to-face -face session um, in a, a dragon's den scenario. I'll sh show you that in a moment. But I just want to make the point that one of the key things that is emerging from our work is that we all know that frequency of contact is especially important in terms of relationship building. And in the past, people may have thought that meant more and more face-to-face -face work. But it's become clear from the evidence of our teachers that this type of online interaction, which, by the way, is not a case of post and go, but rather post and interact. Even though if you can't see this slide in detail, uh, what it's actually showing you is a post and then reaction to that post. And it is that engagement and the interaction that's really important. So here they are, the um, students from year 10, from the two schools. Um, they've just done their joint presentations to uh, Dragon's Den. And I, I think it is important that we stress the, that we absolutely see the value and the potency of face-to-face -face work. What we're proposing is not in any way meant to um, undermine that or to suggest that it's not important. We're interested in how do you maximize that face-to-face -face work through online interaction. So just to summarize what we think the research said before we actually tell you what our, our data is. Um, the literature around all this indicates that there are a number of advantages for both pupils and teachers. Um, firstly, as far as the pupils are concerned, the fact that they have a distant audience uh, seems to make a real difference in terms of the quality and the quantity of what they send the others. They're conscious that this work is not just for their own teachers. Um, and of course, they're able in that process to develop a wide range of skills to do with the use of technology. And for teachers, um, this blended approach seems to fit more easily into their exceptionally busy days. Uh, and, uh, in case we forgot it, um, teachers are expected to assess pupils' work in ICT. Uh, it's a statutory requirement, and that includes the use of ICT for exchange. In other words, when they're interacting with their partner school for shared education, they're also potentially meeting the requirements for the accreditation of ICT. Um, and perhaps also worth adding that all of this is done on the basis that we're not um, suggesting that a lot of expensive equipment has to be bought because the schools already have the hardware and the software to do all this. So, um, very briefly, just to say that there is mounting evidence, both in Northern Ireland, in Israel, and in other parts of the world, in terms of the efficacy of this approach. And in particular, I'd like to just uh, underline the long-term impact that's been established, for example, in looking at, at matched children, some of whom took part in the Dissolving Boundaries program that linked schools in Northern Ireland to the Republic, when they were, data was gathered from them a year after the end of the program, compared to children in the same schools who hadn't been involved, there were significant differences. 
So I think we can be confident that this is a, an approach that's got uh, rigorous uh, scientific support. Just um, uh, one point at the bottom there. Um, you'll be aware that, particularly in post-primary schools, there is a, a, a very considerable emphasis on examination performance, uh, getting the best results you can. And some post-primary schools, I think, therefore find it a challenge to find the best way to embed shared education. So one of the bits of research was specifically targeted at two very exam-focused grammar schools. And uh, the results of that reported there uh, in a paper I produced with uh, Bill Hunter and Lindsay Hollywood showed that they were able to accommodate this within uh, a crowded curriculum. And I think th these practical points are, are, are important. So, um, that's the background. Um, let me bring you right up to the present in terms of the re research that we're going to report on. Um, you'll know that arising from that Shared Education Act, the Education Authority provided a series of professional modules for teachers on different aspects of shared education. Um, along with uh, uh, colleagues from Classroom 2000, C2K, uh, we ran um, a program which we called CLOSER. Uh, that's collaborative learning online for shared education and reconciliation. Um, so the CLOSER work was based on two days of teachers coming together and us showing them how to use Collaborate and Frontier. At the end of two days, they prepared a program of work which they then implemented for six weeks back in their schools, and then they came back for day three to report on what had happened. So we've now uh, taught that module nine times since February 2017. And the data that uh, Rhiannon's going to talk to you about is based on the teachers that attended that course. So I'm now going to hand you over to Rhiannon, who, as I say, was uh, not involved in the teaching of CLOSER, um, and therefore in an ideal position to be an independent uh, analyst. I'll, I'll be back uh, in a few minutes just to uh, finish this off. Thanks, Rihanna. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. So yes, I'm gonna talk through some of the findings. So we had 35 teachers who are from across both communities, and we had them complete an online questionnaire after they had finished the, they, they had done the closer, training course they had then gone away and done their six-week project and then they had come back and at that time we got them to complete an online questionnaire um, and it was a mix of multiple choice questions but we also gave them the opportunity to provide some kind of free responses where they expanded on why they had um, answered in the way that they had on some of the multiple choice questions the teachers were primarily working in primary schools so that we did have some involvement from secondary schools, and the average age of the children that they taught was nine. The shared education uh, partnerships that the teachers were involved in were generally fairly well established, but we, as you can see, we had a huge range. So we had partnerships that ranged from only being in place for one year right through to partnerships that had existed for 25 years. Although there were some of the, in the cases of some of the partnerships, uh, it was walking distance between the two schools for having those face-to-face -face classroom sessions. In the majority of cases, the teachers were from schools where in order to actually bring the children together for those face-to-face -face classes, they would have to use public transport. So it was obviously there was some, it's a little bit more difficult to get the children together. And 95% of the teachers were in schools that were involved in the shared education signature project. Okay, so the first thing that we wanted to find out from teachers was uh, what experience they had in using ICT prior to taking part in Roger's CLOSER course. And what you can see here is that the, the majority of teachers, so it was over two thirds of teachers, primarily uh, uh, used face-to-face -face contact for their shared education classes. So they didn't have a huge amount of experience of using ICT in those classes uh, in order to instigate online contact. 
And I think it's fair to say that the teachers were not ICT specialists. This wasn't something they were necessarily hugely proficient in, particularly in terms of these two softwares that, that, that Roger has been teaching uh, the teachers how to use for their shared education classes, so Fronter and Collaborate. So you can see that, uh, that for a lot, of, a lot of teachers, they were either not at all proficient in using these types of software, or they only had a little bit of experience of using it. So before we started to ask the teachers about uh, their, their experiences of running the project following the closer training, um, we wanted to find out what teachers thought were the most important goals or aims of shared education. Um, and so this is what we found. So in terms of the results, all of these different aims were perceived as being fairly important, but some of them were perceived as being more important than others. So in particular, teachers thought that the most important goal of shared education was respect for difference, followed by preparing children to work together, normalising cross-community relations, and developing friendships. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you can see that the, the area that was perceived as being the least important was dealing with controversy. I think perhaps something that is important to note here is that, that the, the support, support or perceived importance of these goals didn't vary between teachers from the two different communities. There was no significant difference when we did statistical analysis on this. So it seems there is a kind of convergence in the perceived aims or goals of shared education, which I think speaks to the sustainability of shared education, because the teachers seem to be on the same page about what aspects of shared education or what aims of shared education are particularly important. So we next wanted to know, uh, get into what teachers had actually done for their, uh, for their projects following the closer training um, and what methods they'd used. And about 50% of the teachers used Fronter, so that's the asynchronous tool where children could interact with one another, but it you know, wasn't in real time. Um, and about 50% used face-to-face -face contact the most. But when you compare the two different types of ICT methods, Fronter and Collaborate, it's clear that Fronter was used a lot more frequently than Collaborate. And as Roger mentioned before, that's partly because it's, it fits more easily into you know, the daily life in your school. Teachers are very busy and doing lots of different things. But children can fit in, fit in uh, time to respond to the children from the other school and interact with them via this online system. But the other children don't have to actually have to be present. With Collaborate, obviously, it's a little bit more risky and the, it's sort of, sort of difficult to get in place because you have to have the two schools there at the same time. You have to make sure that the, that the software is working in both places. So probably because a lot of these teachers will, be, will have been fairly new to using these sorts of software, to start with, it seems that um, the focus has been on getting, getting to grips with Fronter, and probably over time, Collaborate will be used more frequently as, as teachers get to grips with that software. We next wanted to ask teachers what they thought the benefits were for their pupils in terms of those key aims of shared education that I mentioned previously. What do they think, where do they think the outcomes were and what changes were there, either positive or negative? So on this graph, plus the, the two at the top refers to a big positive change um, in how children were in terms of these goals. One would reflect a slightly positive change Zero means no change, and minus one or minus two means slightly or a, a lot of negative change. And I suppose the obvious thing you can see from here is that all of the changes in, in terms of across all of these different goals were in a positive direction. So that's, that's sort of good news. But obviously, some of these uh, areas were seen as impacting on children more than others. And the, the thing that seemed to come out the most, the most strongly in terms of where the changes were, were in terms of developing friendships. So teachers perceived that this was an area where blended contact was really important. It was really helping to promote children's friendships and friendships between the, the children attending the different schools. Preparing children to work together also emerged as being really important. And next, normalising cross-community relations respect for difference, and to a lesser, lesser extent, although it was still perceived as quite important, improving academic performance. But then again, at the other end of the scale, you have reconciliation and dealing with controversy, which weren't seen as areas that were impacted on as much by the, plen by the blended contact project. So we, we also asked teachers to tell us a little bit about why they, had, they, had, uh, well, why they felt um, the blended contact had had a certain impact on the children. Um, and we've picked out just a few quotes to illustrate uh, 
where the teachers are coming from in terms of why they thought these, thought, they thought these things were even more or less important. So in terms of developing friendships, uh, teachers, this was a, the quote from one teacher, was, which was that friendships have been developed from the very beginning of the process. The children were grouped in all of the initial face-to-face -face meetings, with the groups being, di being different on each occasion. And that meant that, that children got to meet a whole range of different children. So they weren't just, just meeting a couple of children from the other school. They were meeting a whole range of pupils from the other school. This was reinforced through the use of Fronter, so that's the asynchronous tool, uh, the VLE, the Virtual Learning Environment, where the children found out more about each other and were able to leave comments and interact with one another. And this, in turn, was further reinforced through the real-time Collaborate session. So I think what this illustrates really nicely is that the three different methods, so face-to-face -face contact, asynchronous contact using Fronter, and then synchronous contact using Collaborate were being used together and interactively in order to get the best out of children in terms of their development of friendships. In terms of helping to prepare children to work together, one teacher noted that group tasks have encouraged working with others, which has supported children's skills and their communication, and these are vital in getting um, ready to work with others in the future. So this kind of reflects this idea that children are going to learn a sort of set of skills and competencies and confidences that when they finish school and they go out into the wider world and, and you know, they're, they're working in various workplaces, that they have the skills to work with people from a range of different backgrounds. So this is an area where blended contact might be particularly useful. In terms of normalising cross-community relations, another teacher noted that pupils are no longer out of sight, out of mind. The use of Fronter has let us develop and extend lessons within own schools, but pupils are still learning, sharing, and responding to each other's work. And I think the point here is that with, you know, if you just have face-to-face -face contact and the schools are quite far away from each other and they can't be, they can't be together all the time, that the contact is going to be disjointed and stop and start, but by introducing blended contact techniques, you can ensure that that contact is continuous, so they have face-to-face -face contact and that communication, that interaction, that getting to know one another actually continues using those online resources and then can then feed into the next face-to-face -face contact session. So it's really about how contact can be sustained over the longer term, and I think that's where blended contact is really valuable. Next, in terms of respect for difference, one teacher noted that the children were able to ask each other questions about their various interests and, and show an interest in those different things. So things like Gaelic football, Irish dancing or Scottish dancing. And another teacher commented that pupils, well, they, 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 they're, when they're using online content, they have to use these online safety protocols to make sure they're... they're um, interacting with each other in a respectful way. And so that ne naturally led into respect for difference. And the pupils showed respect, even in terms of uh, other children having names they weren't familiar with, and that the comments that the teachers read on front of, from the students to each other demonstrated the respect they had. So this is hopefully indicative that this, this sustained contact that's occurring and is supported by blended contact is helping to develop that sense of respect. In terms of academic performance, so this was an area where it wasn't seen as, as having as big an impact as around things like friendship development um, and normalising relations, but there were some benefits here as well. So children uh, were perceived as being more engaged with completing tasks online um, and having improved ICT skills and being more aware of their spelling and grammar. And the teacher felt this was below, this was, this was a reflection of the fact, the fact that there was a wider audience. So not, not only did they have their teachers and fellow classmates seeing what they'd written, but they also had the pupils from the other school. So it kind of motivated them to put that much more effort in because they knew that their, their work was being, being looked at by various other people. And another teacher noted that it was fantastic to see two particular children in their class with learning difficulties, writing their views in forums without hesitation and not getting hung up on spelling and feeling confident that they could actually expand on their thoughts. And I think that's really nice and perhaps something we wouldn't necessarily have anticipated that this might be especially useful for children with special educational needs. Or one might imagine, for example, children with social anxiety where that face-to-face -face contact might be quite daunting but blended learning might actually make it easier for them to sort of gradually get used to interacting with other people and also just being confident in expressing their thoughts and ideas. In terms of reconciliation, so this was an area where teachers felt that they didn't see as much change. Um, one teacher noted that they 
but they weren't sure how much the children really realised they were they were even from from different communities. They just all saw themselves as children, and it's possible that this is a reflection of the age of the, you know, the, the 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 children being taught by these teachers. They're primary school children. Maybe they're not so aware of the conflict. The teacher also raised the issue that it might differ according to geographical location. So perhaps there are some areas where the conflict is much more salient and where reconciliation might be more of an issue, but in this particular school that it wasn't. But it's worth noting that the participants, uh, the teachers that took part in this survey were from a range of geographical areas. They were from right across Northern Ireland, and none of them really discussed reconciliation as being an area that, that they were really focused on or that they thought children particularly changed in. So I think perhaps this is an area where we need to explore more what teachers understand by the term reconciliation and how they think of it in, in the context of shared education. Um, obviously, in order to be able to use a blended contact, uh, schools need to have the resources, the ICT facilities, to be able to actually do this. Um, so we were interested in finding out from teachers how adequate they felt the resources that they had were. And I suppose on the plus side, optimistically, uh, about two thirds of participants felt that the resources they had were somewhat adequate. Um, although, so clearly there's room for improvement, but you know, there, it wasn't all bad news. But there was kind of quite a large minority who really felt they didn't have the adequate ITC res ITCT resources that they needed. So that's really, this is really an issue, obviously, because if there are going to be um, inequalities in terms of who has the sufficient resources to be able to use blended contact, that's going to potentially have an impact on the efficacy of shared edu education. So it's really important that we think about ways or think about how schools can be supported and we can ensure that they have the facilities they need to make, make the best of blended contact. We also want to know whether teachers connected their use of ICT and shared education with the requirement to assess ICT skills in pupils. And we found that although at the moment teachers perhaps aren't really doing that, they could certainly see the potential for it. So two thirds thought there was real potential for this as a way of linking two different areas of school activity. And again, this potentially speaks to the sustainability of blended contact as a method in shared education, because it, it can be applied to different areas of activity and you know, that it can be used not only to enhance shared education, but also to in, enhance the children's ICT skills and assessment. Finally, we wanted to get a sense of how teachers who had, who had then undertaken this programme, who had, who had done the training and had run the course, how do they then feel about blended contact? Did, is this something that they felt would be useful and would enhance, uh, enhance shared education? And you can see here on the, from the chart on the left that the majority of teachers felt that future planning for shared education should include ICT as having equal importance to face-to-face -face contact. So this was something they saw value in and they wanted to be incorporated into their shared education classes in the future. And we also asked teachers how useful they felt the training course was and 100% of them felt that the course was useful. And as you can see, the majority of them felt that it was a very useful training course in terms of their professional development. So overall, these findings, these findings leave us feeling really kind of optimistic about the potential for blended contact to be used as part of shared education and to really support and enhance the, the effectiveness of shared education. And to me, I think the most exciting aspect of it is that it can be used to maintain sustained contact over time, that it's not going to be stopping and starting. Children don't have to reacquaint themselves with the, the pupils from the other school. When they get back into the next class, they can just continue by having that online interaction. And there's a huge body of, uh, of research which shows that sustained positive intergroup contact that is, is, has the potential to develop friendships in this way, it's especially effective at improving inter-community relations. So I'm now going to pass back to Roger, who's going to um, do some summing up. We've really just left you with some questions that we think are perhaps worth uh, thinking about for the discussion time. Um, should blended contact be a priority? Um, and we're interested in this notion of the convergence between both Catholic and Protestant teachers in terms of their support for this. Um, how, much, how important should this kind of training be in terms of the overall strategy for the future? And how can we enhance the ICT infrastructure? So with that, um, thank you all very much for, for listening. We look forward to talking to you later. <laughs>